that um, is translated as outspoken, or it's not necessarily translated as outspoken, that's what the word means, poaxesis. Ah. And um, it's translated plainly, openly, uh, and uh, boldly, in many cases in the word of God. We're going to cover a few of them. But on the night that Jesus, and uh, when his trial was going forth, and they were about to crucify him, and uh, poor old Peter, he's already denied him a time, and he stands there at the trial. And of course, the chief priest comes up and, open your Bibles to uh, John chapter 18 for me. John chapter 18 to this place. We're going to pick it up in about the 19th verse where the chief priest insinuates. What kind of secret doctrine is this you're putting out? What kind of sect is this? Now there's one thing you want to always remember about Christ. He knew what everyone was thinking because uh, our father can read minds. But the only time that he taught uh, secretly, and it wasn't secret then, there was always 12 there, or uh, there was, it's rare that he taught one such as the woman at the well in Samaria. And, uh, but then where the Holy Spirit is, there's always two witnesses anyway. So, um, the fact is, he spoke openly. What does that get for you? Just like now, we're speaking openly. We're going into three, over 325 television stations. There's no secrets in that. Therefore, they can't accuse you of being a sect or something of that nature if you publicly speak and never teach special classes hidden from sight. That's Satan's mark, okay? And that's a mark that probably it is a, a sect of some kind. But with God's word, you can always be openly. The whole idea is to publish God's word. Now, naturally, in the business end of the church, such as fi um, acquiring new stations and so forth, and never let Satan know what you're doing until it's done, and then say, gotcha, all right? Let, he'll, don't, he can't read your mind. Don't let him know what you're doing. I guarantee you he'll throw blocks in your path. And you may forget that you have power over him. You may forget how to take names and kick dragon. You must always, always be wiser than the serpent. Okay. In your life, every day, you must be wiser than that that comes against you. That way you're always successful. You're never a quitter. You might change courses at time when you say, God, I see this is not the way to go. I got the message. Then plan more, pray more, and get on with it. Get on with your life. Don't be a quitter. Satan just loves quitters because he's got your number. All right? Keep plowing. So, when we get to the 19th verse of this to document what I'm saying... In this 18th chapter of St. John, we ask that word of wisdom from our Father concerning his word. The old chief priest, the high priest rather, says in the 19th verse of the 18th chapter, the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples, that's your students, what, what are those students doing? And of his doctrine, indicating there's something really hidden here. Now bear in mind, the mark of success is prosperity in getting the word out. I didn't say money. I said getting the word out. Uh, teaching people the truth from God's word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Not by traditions of men. Well, the dear brother said this. Well, is it biblical? Then you might listen to it. If it isn't, it could be a bunch of junk. All right, so you always govern by God's word. Why? He's judging. It's what you're going to be judged by. If you are judged, if you think you're going to be judged by the traditions of men, and you align with the traditions of men, 
and you're judged by God's word, you might be one of those that came up to Jesus when he did return at the second advent as it is prophesied in the New Testament. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. We've been doing all kinds of great works for you. We've been casting out demons and we've been hailing in your name. He said, you get out of here. I never, I repeat, never knew you. Only one way you can tell if it comes from this word, the word of God. That's why you always want to teach it boldly. You want to teach it publicly and um, reassuringly and the truth. And that way you will never have to apologize. You'll never have to be embarrassed because God will be proud of you and he will bless you. So they, they kind of, they're trying to put him in a corner. What kind of stuff is this your students and you are doing here? Of course, they'd been healing a lot of people, casting out a lot of demons, and it was ruining the super preacher's reputation. Got it? Verse 20. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. There was no secret about it. I even taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. In other words, remember he was in Judea. And the word eudas in the Greek means the citizens of Judea where they gather and meet to serve, uh, practice God's uh, word. So I, I taught openly right in your temple. Verse 21. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. There's a lot of witnesses out there in other words. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. Now, I want you to see within that is why you always speak publicly. Why that um, you, uh, now I know when we're planting seeds, that's not possible. But I'm speaking about when you do belong to an organization or whatever. Make sure it's open. And make sure it's God's word that is taught there openly. Or you're going to, you could be headed for trouble. You, you've got a lot of fruitcakes that run around, especially in this end generation, that like to practice their own thoughts. And when their thoughts don't align with God's word, you're headed down Primrose Lane, and you're about to get your rose bush trimmed. Good. Okay. 22. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers, which... Uh, stood by, struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? In other words, don't, don't you talk back to our man. Now, he's one of the ones I want to get a hold of in the millennium. I really do. This old Marine would like to have a word with him. All right? Verse 23. Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. You tell me about it. Document it. But if well, why smitest thou me? In other words, when you do speak openly, and when you do speak boldly, uh, Christ's word, you don't have anything to apologize for. And if, if and should, Jesus always set the example for you. If you're challenged, say, document it. Because if you stick with God's word, you'll never have to make an apology. All right? You may have to do some correction, and you may have to do some teaching, but that's what it's all about, is getting people deeper into God's Word, not man's Word. Beware man's Word. It will lead you in a place, perhaps. I mean, it's all right to listen to man check him out in the Word of God. So when Jesus used the word open here in the Greek, it is poresia. Parasia. It is spelled P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. -R -R -E and um, again pronounced parasia. And it means all outspokenness. It means frankness. It means publicity, assurance, and boldly. So when we do it God's way, we don't have to apologize. We don't have to be ashamed. I mean, get real with me. 
the thing we don't want to be ashamed of is when we stand on judgment day, okay? When God judges you. If you can't help people stand tall and stand for something, Christ in other words, on that day, then you're not helping people a whole lot because that's what we look forward to where our Father reaches out to you and says, My good and faithful servant, well done. That's what we want. We want you to arrive at that point where you have taken his advice, followed his example. So that's the example. I mean, he's about to be sentenced to death here. It will happen very soon after this. And his mind is still on teaching, just as it will be as he hangs on the cross. He repeats the 22nd Psalm, still teaching, openly, boldly, and with frankness, so that you could not be deceived by the evil workers and teachers, false teachers, that are in this world. Well, how can I judge a false teacher? Well, usually they don't teach from God's Word, okay? Boy, I mean, when that happens, you've got you a pretty good clue. That, I mean, you want to you let the, ear, the red flags go up and mark that individual. You can listen to what they say because you're intelligent. You know God's Word. And if they're not aligning with it and teaching God's Word, I really, if you're going to call it church or study, I really don't know what you're doing there. I really wouldn't. You know, it would be kind of a waste of time, wouldn't it? If you were... Uh, by this, now don't misquote me. I said, if you want to study God's Word and call it church or a study, if you're studying something other than God's Word, you're most likely, in part, wasting your time. And if you can't stand for something and that be Christ, probably you'll stand for anything. And people in this life that stand for anything. Um, our Father is not all that happy with them. Jesus was direct, frank, spoke boldly, and challenged them. He said, why did you hit me? What have I done? You tell me. Document it. And of course, all he had ever done is good works. But you see, this is where the red flag goes up. Good works for who? For believers. If it's one of Satan's crowd, it's considered bad work. So he kind of branded himself when he would even try to correct the um, Emmanuel God with us. Let's turn back to the seventh chapter of this great book of John. And in this seventh chapter, even Christ's brethren family, St. John chapter 7, <clears throat> I want to read verses 4 through 6 to begin with here. <clears throat> Jesus is kind of in his own stomping grounds here. As you notice, he's in Galilee, and in verse 3, his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart thence, this would be verse 3, and go into Judea that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. I mean, advertise this. Verse 4, And there is no man that doth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. There is our word, parousia. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Verse 5, this is why we can... For neither did his brethren believe in him. So probably, sometimes your own family, when you come into truth, will look at you strangely. Hopefully not now. But the word will. Uh, so, but a wise person knows how to handle that. Never let scripture split your family. Just don't talk about religion or uh, whatever it is that bugs them. Just go on and let your life. Let your life be the example that you live before them, that they begin to want some of what you've got. And that's blessings. All right? Because if you meet the commandments of God, by that I mean nobody's perfect now, but if you meet the conditions and you try, I guarantee you God's going to bless you. 
I've, I've been in the work too many years not to have seen it come to pass over and over and over and over again. Always be honest with God. Stand for something and he will stand for you. Okay, now um, as we're in this chapter, they, um, Jesus had healed an old boy. And he healed him on the Sabbath day. And it got a lot of super preachers upset. Okay. Mainly, do you know why it upset them? They couldn't do it. This is, what, this is why the church was so upset about the Lord uh, when he walked the earth. They couldn't cut it. But he could. So he healed this man, and they're kind of dressing him down a little bit. Let's see how he handles it. Let's pick it up in the 14th verse uh, of the 7th chapter, and let's go with it there. And now, about the midst of the feast, Je this is the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Now, what did he do? Did he go out behind the church house and get a little handy bunch there that he could sway. No. He went right into the temple. He did it openly. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? The word letters here is grama, gramma. And it comes from the prime graph Oh, which means to grave, engrave, or write, or make a graph, or whatever, okay? How, how is it he knows all this? And there they had the living word right before them. And they would ask a question like this. You know, when you have a working knowledge of God's word, I guarantee you that wherever you are, and... Use, uh, hear me well, I've been on some panels with some pretty, uh, what do I want to call them? Um, I mean, high octane, all right, let me get away with that so I don't have to call the mention names or anything. But there happened to be a person of a belief there. Um, well, he was a rabbi, okay, and we were answering Bible questions. And a person asked a question from Leviticus, and he looked over at me, and he says, you take that one, because I haven't studied Leviticus since the seminary. Okay, and I thought, and I'm not knocking any religion, doesn't have anything to do with that, because there are some well-studied rabbis. But I thought this was kind of a shame, in a way, you know, to, that a man couldn't and take a question from a congregation. Of course, I do it all the time. And either the way you do it, according, you know, according to what some is, you, you either have to know the answers or be able to make something up quick. Okay. <laughs> so, or, or you'll get caught. <laughs> if you make something up, you will get caught. Never be ashamed to say, wow, that's a good question because I don't know the answer. See, it's a good question for you because you're both going to learn something. Never be ashamed of that. Many... I do have a lot of pastors say, do you mean you open yourself up for live questions? We used to do it even live on television. I quit that because we got some vulgar, vulgar people out there that ask some questions about things we don't even, they were not even allowed to talk about. Um, they talk dirty, in other words. So I decided, we're, we're, I'm getting rid of that, okay, where we have a little. But anyway, do so you really take questions from, yeah. And it, it kind of amazes them, but why, you know, what's wrong with saying, I don't know? Haven't you had to say that a time or two? Everybody has, you know? So that way, if we're studying, I mean, you all don't think I know everything, do you? You do? <laughs> oh, <laughs> nobody does, okay? So never, never be put on the spot that way. If we don't know, we don't know, but hey, we got somewhere to find out. All right, and I, perhaps I'm digressing here a little bit, but uh, be that as it may, 
speak openly, freely, and, um, and uh, teach God's Word when you're ready to handle it, okay? Make sure you're ready. Like a, a fellow asked me one time, how do I know when I should start teaching? Well, it's when people want to listen to you, okay? That's how you tell. If nobody wants to listen to you, you get back to it. It's not time yet. Okay, verse 15. Uh, oh, we got that. 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. In other words, naturally, we as Christians know he's saying, My doctrine is not my doctrine, it's the doctrine of Almighty God. Verse 17. If any man will do his will, that's the Father's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, um, in a way, if they knew the doctrine of the Father, they would have known who he was. Meaning what? Meaning they would be very familiar with Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Because God's word foretold of him long, long ago. What does it say in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14? It says, uh, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and um, a child shall be born, and you will call his name Emmanuel. Well, that's what Jesus was called, Emmanuel. And in many other places, that it would come from Bethlehem. That he would be born at Bethlehem, rather. And, um, and so forth. In other words, what Jesus has kind of put him on the spot. That if you knew the scripture, you'd know. You would. Verse 18. I mean, let me go just one step further on that. If they were familiar with Daniel from the Old Testament, from the Word, Daniel even gave the year in which he would appear. It would happen. So what he's saying is, if you, if you knew God's will and word, you'd know what's happening here. Verse 18. He that speaketh of himself speaketh of his glory. That's his praise. But he that speaketh his glory that sent him, that's our Father, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. In other words, these miracles I'm performing, the man I healed, I didn't do it. God did. Okay. Verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? Now, I mean, you know, Jesus never pulled any punches either. I mean, you know, if you know the law of Moses, you know what the penalty is for murder. What are you going about to murder me? Now, and what, where is he doing this? Back in a corner with just these boys? No. Beloved, the secret is do it publicly. When you know you're right from God's word, Christ knew he was. What did they say? 20. The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? We never heard of such a thing. Well, every one of them had. They knew that the church, even though he was teaching in the temple, was looking for him. In other words, they're lying. Let's document it. 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. 22. He's going to give them a little scripture lesson here now. Moses, therefore, gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. Uh, and um, Genesis 17, okay? And ye, ye, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. I mean, uh, there you go, you do it. 23, if a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, why, I'll insert, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? In other words, I, through Almighty God, have taken a man and made him whole that was, was um, lamed. 24. Judge not according to the appearance, 
but judge righteous judgment. In other words, you be just. Think about it. In the first place, what kind of person would you be if there was a paralyzed person and God healed him on whatever day God wanted to? Who are you to complain about that? Think about it a moment, all right? What kind of person would complain about such a blessing as that? It kind of gives you the mindset. That's why I'm drawing attention to it, okay? Verse 25, listen carefully. Here's where they kind of blow their cover. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? Every one of them knew it. And they put on the dog like, How about fuck? You've got a devil. Who wants to kill you? Who's going? They all knew it bunch of liars you know some people like to play church don't they well 26 but lo he speaketh boldly underline it that's our word parasia and they say nothing unto him how well, they couldn't do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ I mean have they been convinced they're kind of beginning to make believers out of us. What he's saying makes sense to us. You know, but they kind of blow their whole, I mean, the whole scam, all right? The fact that they're trying to kill him. And Christ, through speaking boldly, and it is the word of God and nobody can deny it, quoting Moses' law, and I mean laying it out on the line, Anybody that would have spoken would have made a fool out of himself. And that's one thing scripture lawyers do not like to do is make fools out of themselves because it, they lose congregation. Okay? So learn the lesson. Always speak publicly in your teaching and sharing. Don't have any secrets about it and let it be the word of God. Old and new. Two witnesses. The old and new. The new, because one backs the other. One explains why we have the new, much as we documented back in the 17th uh, verse. Let's go a little further. 27. How be it? We know this man whence he is. We know him. But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. In other words, it was, um, it was reported uh, in the law and not biblical law, law of the, the church of that day, that when he appeared, they would, he would be taken and hid for a season, okay? And that he would come from Bethlehem. Well, just because he's a Nazarene doesn't mean he wasn't born at Bethlehem, you got it? You see, and it goes a lot deeper than that when you get to the bottom of it. Who died near Bethlehem or at Bethlehem? giving birth to a child, you know it was Rachel. She, gave, she died giving birth to the last of the 12 patriarchs, that's to say the 12 tribes of Israel. And she named the lad Benai, which is to say son of Masaro, because he was killing her, the birth was. And the father, of course, changed the name to Benjamin, son of my right hand. So it happened there. God, uh, geographical locations mean something to our Father. They never make a religion out of it, but that's how you, many clues of God's more in-depth teaching you will find within that. Why does Rachel cry, weep for her children? 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Now did it say he whispered? And he said, he cried, he spoke strongly and boldly. Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. 29, but I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Let's go another verse or two. Then they sought to take him, but no man lays hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. Listen co closely to that and even back up in the scripture further up here. He said, what did he tell the brethren that didn't believe on him? He says, it's, it's not time. 
And here, what did it say? Um, the, um, the, the timing is extremely important. His hour is not yet come. They couldn't lay hands on him. It wasn't time for him to be crucified. Now, in your teaching, you must also watch the time. Well, how, how do I... Let's, let's uh, take an analogy of planting seeds. If somebody's really busy on an emergency, and you walk up and, I mean, let's say, they, let's say it's a farmer out here and he's got a calf that's dying because it's bloated, and if he doesn't get the crystals down his throat pretty quick, the calf's going to die. And you drop by and say, let's talk Bible a minute. He's going to tell you where to go. And it will be one of the places the Bible mentions, probably. Okay. So, time, you have to sense. That's what the Holy Spirit helps you with. Is sensing when the right moment is. Now, these married couples all know. Okay. Especially the ladies. Okay. They know when the right time is. When the old man says, well, honey, I've decided I need a new lawnmower because I'm tired of pushing the old one and I'd like to get one of them riding machines. And that's when she says, and I'm tired of scrubbing clothes on the board and this is the time for me to bring up a washing machine. Okay? Isn't it funny how women are? They always think about themselves. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh, Lordy. <laughs> anyway, um, Hey, he should have, see, he's the one that's using bad timing. He should have got her a new washing machine and then said, Oh dear, how I loveth thee. <laughs> you know, and go at it. T timing is just about one of the most important things in how receptive someone is to teaching when you do teach frankly and boldly. Or they're going to turn away from you and probably think you're some kind of a, well, well, what do we want to call it? Busy body, you know, button in with what? And you, you know, but let it, if it's right, if the time is right, and their ears are open, and hey, they may not receive it right then, but they may later. And that's what's important. If you pick the right time and let the Spirit guide you, then everything's going to be well. Okay, let's, let's go to another place here. Let's go to the 16th chapter of St. John. I'm being nice to you all. I'm staying in the same book. Okay? For a while. <laughs> 16th chapter. <clears throat> Excuse me. And let's pick it up with um, verse uh, 19. He's trying to explain to them the crucifixion, the fact that he's going to die on the cross. And he's going to go away a while. But then he will come back. And this is one of the greatest things of teaching. Up here he said, I'm going to be gone, but I'll be back. And they're saying, How? What, what does he mean? Now, watch the way Christ teaches when he brings this down to a natural event in life. Creating an analogy, plainly, that flows where everyone can understand. Verse 19, here we go, and you'll catch on as we get along here. Trying to explain to them how he's going to go away and come... I mean, you know, it wasn't every day that somebody was raised from the dead. Okay, and he's trying to get this point across. Now, Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and say unto him, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and you shall not see me, and again a little while, and you shall see me. In other words, he knew what they were thinking, and he was saying, I know y'all are just dying to ask me this. 20. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. What? At his death, of course. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Now that's hard to explain, isn't it, to somebody that didn't know about 
defeating death, that death didn't mean anything to us anymore that much. Sure, we miss our loved ones when they die, but we know where they are. And, and um, so there you have it. They go to the Father, who that's where we all kind of want to be ultimately, isn't it? I mean, there's no shortcuts, but verse 21, he uses this analogy. A woman, when she is in travail, labor pains, has sorrow. Because her hour is come. I mean, this is it. The labor pains have closed in. Five, four, three, two, one. It's on. Okay. And 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 I know from. Uh, I guess a man doesn't really have the right to talk about this because I guess it's more painful than a man can handle. Okay, that's for sure. But I mean, it is pain. Great pain. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. What a beautiful analogy he used to explain his resurrection and his return. Doesn't it kind of make your mind go back to the verse I quoted there from Isaiah? A virgin shall conceive, a child shall be born, a man child shall be born, so forth. He uses that analogy here that you can understand. And, and look into it a little deeper than that. The fact that when God made his, created his overall plan you know, of salvation, that he defeated death right then. And then he himself, as it is written in Hebrews chapter 2, thought himself not too good to come and participate in the flesh the same as we do and defeat death, which is to say the devil. I'm quoting from Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 for your information. That's why he was born in the flesh was to kill Satan because Satan crucified him or killed him on the cross. Therefore, God had just right to cause Satan to walk into the lake of fire. Okay? But what a beautiful analogy to, to bring this in where they could, whereby they could see and understand. That is the mark of a teacher, all right, is when you got it together whereby it, it doesn't matter how much you know, okay? It doesn't, it's what you can teach someone. In other words, if, if you were, if we were to go out here and as, experienced as you are in the Word of God, and let's pick somebody that's never been inside a church before. And it would, would you start saying, the first thing I want you to know is I know everything there is to know about the Bible. And I want you to take all things into consideration, the commandments and judgments and everything, and you might as well pull the old thing, first take up an offering. Okay, do something religious, all right? And then give a few, you're going to go to hell, okay, if you don't do it this way. I mean, really bless them, all right? Really bless them. Or, or, are you going to go down to that person's level and teach them? You know, don't, don't try to make a name for yourself about how much you know. You've got to get down where they are. Now, don't, don't tack some moral thing on me here with this. Understand, I'm talking about teaching God's Word. That's the highest moral you'll ever accomplish. But get down on the level that they are of learning and bring them up to where you are or you'll never teach. Okay? Doesn't matter what you know. It's how well you can understand that person to simplify. If necessary, through an analogy, that means that for instance, like a pregnancy, to make something flow with clarity and teach it boldly. And then you're beginning to get there, okay? And um, so, verse, uh, I'm going to say 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Did he say you should pray to me and ask me? A lot of people make a mistake here, as simple as it is. You don't pray to Jesus. You pray to the Father, and you ask it in Jesus' name. 
That documents that you're a Christian, okay? 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. We're talking about knowledge. We're talking about understanding God's word. If, if you ask for something personal, eh, you know, if it's possible, he'll, if you're not going to hurt yourself with it, you know, it's like your little kid might say, Oh, Daddy, I want a diamondback rattlesnake with ten rattlers to play with. Well, boy, you can just dream on. Well, some of them, some say, uh, Father, I want a brand new Cadillac with four shiny chrome hubcaps, and I want it to do 120. And Father knows that boy's going to rack himself up on a tree and kill himself deader than a hammer. And God says, you can just go on, boy. <laughs> okay. But if you're going to ask for something to do God's work, whether it be knowledge, wisdom, bricks to build a building, hey, you do the work. You, you with me? You, am I coming through? You got to do the work. He'll furnish the brick. Okay. He, he doesn't like these people that make big promises and never mount the hoot. Okay? That's just the way God operates. Well, how do I know that? I know from experience. Okay? Ask and you shall receive. Ask in Jesus' name. 25. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. Could be considered a riddle a little bit. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Well, that time has come, friend, because he sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives you unction into the Scripture, whereby you can understand. The word, uh, the word uh, plainly here is, um, is uh, par, our, our word, parfosia, okay? Do it plainly, publicly. He said, I'm going to do it. There's nothing secret about it. It's not some secret sect or cult, okay? Verse 26, all that day you shall ask in my name. At that day, rather, you shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. 27, for the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God, Emmanuel, God with us. 28, I come forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. They understood that. Listen to the disciples. 29, his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly. That's our word. And speakest no proverb. Parousia. You lay, you've laid it out for us. It's clear. It's simple. It's reassuring. It's outspoken. There's nothing mumbo-jumbo about it. Okay? And there you have it. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee, but this we believe, that thou comest forth from God. And there they were. Again, what do you do? Plain, spoken, outspoken and if anybody thinks that I'm saying be abrasive I'm not okay just be to the point you know that's quite frankly let's get this right down where the rubber meets the road that's just common sense okay just plain old common sense and uh, and from that we we know our father okay and um, and there we have it so uh, let's, let's go on over to the book of Ephesians as we come up here to a closing place. <clears throat> the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. Book of Ephesians, chapter 3, we're going to take it with verse 8. Um, you know, old Paul was drafted by Christ. He didn't volunteer. He didn't go down to some altar call. Wham! God said, you're it, boy. Get to it. Okay? 
It did, and Paul being a real, I mean, if any one of us could be the scholar, Paul was. I mean, he studied under Gamiel, and he had a special gift from God. And he could speak many languages. He could speak more languages than most any person, okay? Or tongues, however you want to say it. He could speak Latin from Rome. He could speak Greek. He could speak Hebrew, uh, Chaldee, uh, no doubt all five dialects. Uh, though he was like a lot of us when we learned languages, it was street Greek, but he had it down pretty good. So, um, he, he was sent to the Gentile, and he's talking about that a little bit. He had three different levels that he taught on. Verse 8, we'll explain, let's go with it, of chapter 3, Ephesians. Unto me, Paul speaking, who am less than the least of all saints. In other words, I persecuted the church, I drug out women and men, and put them in jail, and... Poor old Stephen even died at his feet. He, he, Paul never forgave himself for that completely. That's why he made this statement. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? Uh, and, and beloved, they're there. Don't forget to cash in on it, okay? The truth, the, the peace of mind that you have from the scripture as to make all men, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. There's a lot of depth there. Well, what did he mean created by Jesus Christ? Emmanuel, God with us. Who do you think created it? It wasn't Satan, okay? And what was the great mystery? Salvation. The plan of salvation. How that things had to go by so that we sinners on repentance could have forgiveness and share our love with him and have it returned. Ten. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Who do you think those are? Satan and his little angels. Do you realize you do have power over them, don't you? Of course you do. Order them out in Jesus' name. Might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And, and uh, those words sound like, that's a mystery and it's hidden from the foundation. How could I ever understand? Simplicity. Plan of salvation. The fact there was an earth age before this one. They messed up big time what's new under the sun, they do again. Nothing, nothing big about that. So he destroyed the earth age rather than his children and brought in the age of salvation. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, eternal means that's a long time. And don't forget what Jesus means. Yahweh's Savior. That's the purpose, so that you could be saved and anointed. That's what Messiah means, the anointed one. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness, there you got it, boldness, and access, and you've got what? And access with confidence by the faith of him. Don't you ever forget it. Guaranteed access, that's... We could even put a legal twist to this. It's your guarantee. If you have the faith. And if you practice it. But most of all, if you simply know it. And believe it. Then faith comes easy. 13. Wherefore I desire that you faint not. At my tribulation for you. Which is your glory. And that, old Paul got beat around pretty good. But... Uh, um, as it is, 14, but he didn't mind, that's my point. You know, he, he knew he, he had persecuted the church so much, I guess he figured he had some of it coming. I don't know my thoughts. 14, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 5, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. So, um, there we have it. I want to go, I want to go on over to the sixth chapter.
You're all familiar with this chapter because it is the gospel armor. Why, why do you put the gospel armor on to stand against our enemies in higher places and, and the principalities, the host of heaven? That means against evil spirits, against Satan, against anything negative that he can throw at you. You put that gospel armor on. I'm not going to take you through the armor. I might just mention two pieces. That's the girt, the belt, is what? The word of God. That'll hold your britches up, friend. Otherwise, you might lose them. Take the word of God and surround yourself in it and wear it real snug and let it be comfortable. Well, what if it isn't comfortable? Well, study till it is. Keep at it. You'll do good. And, of course, the shield is Christ. Have the faith, have him out in front of you. If you believe, he is. Now, back to our subject. Pick it up with verse 18. Praying of, of chapter 6, the book of Ephesians. Praying always with um, all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all uh, perseverance and supplication for all saints. Uh, God always supplies if you ask in his name. 19, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, all right, to make known the mystery of the gospel. And there's our word boldly again, okay? Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that Therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, of course, this is parousia in the Greek with adzumia, he added to it, which means even more direct, more stressful that you could see. Um, so, there we have it. I want to go to one more place that comes to mind. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're, and we're going to stop there, and it's going to take just a second. Chapter 2, verse 1, the Paul teaching, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in and to you, that it is not in vain. Anytime you're teaching God's word and you're doing it his way, you're not wasting time. And vain can mean vanity is empty, empty-headed, not. It's going to serve a purpose. Two, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, and they were, we were bold. There's our word. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. I mean, there was trouble there, but we did, still did it. Learn this lesson openly. They didn't apologize. And, and, and this is uh, parousia with adzumahi added to it to stress the point, okay? For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guile. We laid it out in truth and just, the word of God. But as we were allowed of God to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. So, don't ever be a man pleaser. That is to say, never teach just to please men. If you do, there's probably, God has a special place for you. He doesn't like people that mislead his children. And I do mean big time. Do not be a man pleaser. Now, many might say, well, I, I want to be well liked. I, I, want, I want people to like me. Everybody does, okay? Hardest thing in the world was for me to get over that obstacle because I'm, you know, I've always loved my neighbors and, you know, if I wave at somebody, I want them to wave back. But I found out if you're a very successful pastor that, Sometimes other preachers don't wave at you. And that, that really, I thought, well, I want to be liked. And then I thought, I don't care. Who cares? God's word comes first. 
Now, don't, let, don't take that as a smart aleck reply. This is what my conclusion, this is what I personally came to the conclusion of, very good English, um, um, that if I please God, it will please the people I want to be friends with, and hopefully many more. And if it doesn't, I started to say an Italian word, and I'm not sure what all the ramifications of that word is, so I think I will withdraw sola me, okay? Um, anyway, it, don't be a man pleaser, okay? You just can't please everyone anyway. You know, we get about 1,100 letters a day, or, or I do, basically. And most of them are our orders or just uh, support, blah, blah, blah. And, and then it melts on down to where some old boy will say, I want you to know as a Christian I cannot stand you. <laughs> but you really burn me, okay? Well, that's fine, you know. You know, and he'll say, I think I'm just going to quit listening. Well, that's okay. But I guarantee you he won't, <laughs> okay? If, if you keep teaching the Word, do it boldly. And it isn't, first of all, know this. It isn't you that does it. Never follow a man. Follow the Word of God, okay? It's God's Word that does it. But never get on a high horse that you can't take criticism. As a matter of fact, I get so many letters that tell me how great I am when it's really the word that's great. You, do you understand where I'm coming from? Oh, brother, you're, you're a good man. Well, you know, what most people don't realize, that's Satan's M.O. And I'm not calling people satanic. I'm just saying Satan butters people up to get their... Well, brother, you're a good judge of character. I can see that. And they let their guard down and, Row. you know, he moves right in, you know. But um, it's good to get a letter every once in a while that's really critical because you need a laugh every once in a while, okay? If you know you're pleasing God and he's blessing you, everybody deserves a good laugh. What I really get a kick out of is someone that can only speak one language, English, and they're going to correct someone that is a student. And they go off in big, long, I'm, I'm going to quit. I'm going to offend, I'm really going to offend somebody. And that's not what I'm doing that for. I'm saying as you teach, don't be offended because someone doesn't understand you. Be patient. And, but by the grace of God, there go you. Okay? All right. Hey, I love you all. Our Father is so good to us. Be bold, be frank, be outspoken when it comes to teaching and living God's word. And God will be pleased and he will bless. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of serving you. Father, be with us this day. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen.